Right, good morning, everybody. I'm now going to try to do in 30 minutes a talk that I usually just take four hours. Uh, so this is going to be fast. I apologize. So this is and it's going to be brief. Okay. You've seen my conflicts before. I'm going to skip that. This is just to tell you that I'm going to talk about the use of medications, and some of these medications aren't approved for use in children, and we're going to go on from there. Okay. So to summarize my presentation, there are no treatments for autism spectrum disorder. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> You've already learned from me that autism spectrum disorder is a syndrome. It's a group of symptoms that tend to cluster together and share common natural history. Heterogeneity is the hallmark of this syndrome. It's phenotypically heterogeneous, and it's also ideologically heterogeneous. And as a result, there's no can't be any specific treatment for autism spectrum disorder. Instead, all treatments target symptoms. And those treatments will not be the same for everyone with the syndrome. So, just be clear, I'm never going to tell you about any treatment for ASD. I'm going to talk to you about symptoms of ASD. Before we do this, I want to be clear we understand that our goal is for evidence-based treatments. And I'm going to talk to you for a moment about what is evidence. Not all evidence is created equal. And you'll hear assertions from time to time that treatments work because they were done based on a study. There are many kinds of studies that vary enormously. There are standards for the quality of a study. The Cochrane um, group and the NICE group in the UK are good examples of these internationally recognized associations that establish criteria and then assess uh, treatments for that. So if you want to know whether a treatment is up to date, go to one of these websites and they usually will review them in some form or another. There is a grading of evidence. The highest level of evidence to support a treatment is a systematic review of randomized control trials, usually, <coughs> usually with a meta-analysis. Secondly, the second level is a randomized control trial with narrow confidence intervals. That means the outcomes for almost everybody participating were quite good. And then it goes down from there, cohort studies, and low quality randomized control trials all the way down to so-called expert opinion. I had one patient and I think they did better. That's the lowest level of evidence. When we really talk about evidence base, we're talking about levels 1A and 1B and occasionally 2A and 2B. Once we get below level two, we now have to be concerned. And we then have to assess the strength of the evidence. So what was the quality of the methods in the study? Was the design appropriate? Was there sampling bias? Are the confounds appropriately cared for? And did the investigators appropriately test the null hypothesis? Did the study reach statistical significance? And that means you have to understand the analytic techniques used, the test of significance that was used. And just because they said they did it doesn't mean they did it right. And you have to correct for multiple comparisons. If you have a study of five people and you're measuring 100 things, the likelihood that some will be positive is quite great. And if you don't correct for that, you could end up with a false positive finding that's meaningless. And then you have to be careful that there aren't post hoc analyses. A well done study says up front, this is what I'm studying, this is how I'm going to measure it, and at the end they measure it, and then they analyze it. They don't say, oh, gee, I wish I had measured this, and then I want to measure it, and then analyze it after the fact. That's biased, not acceptable. And then how relevant are the findings? Is something clinically significant? So it could be statistically significant, but not meaningful. One of the studies that goes back many years in autism was the use of fenfluramine, a drug that was quite powerful, and showed IQ changes in individuals from, their average IQs went from 47 to 51. And it was statistically significant. But it's not meaningful in any clinical sense. So you have to understand that. And then the sensitivity, specificity of findings, and the effect size. A tiny effect size will mean it may not be terribly relevant. And then, of course, confidence intervals have to be appropriately narrow to justify the findings. So what is an effective treatment? An effective treatment is one that starts by building on skills. It means you have to know the skills of the individual patient and be able to respond to them. You work around limits and deficits. You try to compensate for them. That's a good treatment. 
It, in our case of ASD, it has to take place in a developmental context. This is a developmental disorder. And so we have to understand that the individual is developing, but we also have to know their developmental level, so we pitch the treatment at that level. And as much as possible, we want to be in a naturalistic environment because that gives us an opportunity to um, generalize whatever intervention we use to broader uh, experience in the individual's lives. And then, we, then we, a good study has to demonstrate not only eff efficacy, but optimally also effectiveness. Efficacy is what we do in a control trial. Effectiveness is what we demonstrate in a, in a naturalistic setting. And of course, we must always remember to not do any harm. And any good treatment is constantly evaluated using standards that are established a priori. So even in the clinical care of a patient, I say up front, this is the outcome I'm looking for, and this is how I'm going to measure it, and then I follow it over time. I don't guess. So if I want to know whether a child's gaining weight, I weigh him at baseline, and then I weigh him intermittently through the treatment. If I want to know whether a child is less or more hyperactive, then I have a measure for that, and I do it beforehand and during the treatment and at the end point. And if they're not getting better, then I have a, a, a measure that I know, and I can change my treatment. This slide looks a little bit uh, confusing, but it's a, a, a graph plotting individual participants in a positive psychopharmacology trial. Doesn't really matter what the, the medication was, but it's an uh, um, atypical neuroleptic in the treatment of behavior problems in children with ASD. The critical point is, in this trial, which was definitely positive, some of the children got better, some of the children got worse, and some of the children didn't change at all. And so in any given study, we look at group level analyses, which you have to remember, individual kids may not have done as well. And so it's unlikely that a single trial will find a treatment for anybody. Appropriate assessment is a starting point for treatment. If you don't know what you got, you don't know what you're doing. So the common deficits that seem to be most problematic in, in ASD are related to developmental delays, cognitive deficits, language problems, behavior problems, social deficits, joint attention, and experiential deficits. These are the things that seem to be the most likely targets for intervention. I want to say something briefly about experiential deficits because it's quite important, and I won't address it directly later. People who have developmental disorders, and in particular those who have behavior problems, often have limited access to environmental experiences. They can't go out as much because people are afraid to take them out, or when they're out, they get disruptive. And when they're in those settings, that create, when they can't go to those settings, they miss experiences that are an essential part of life. They can't learn what it's like to do these things. And so one of the critical elements of what we do is try to think about how we can create environmental experiences for our patients. And that means being able to include them in a variety of things. So in the United States, one of the things we did in, when I was in Illinois, we worked with the churches. But you could do exactly the same thing with the mosques because it's an important part of the community for the children to participate in religious life. So we literally went to churches and talked to priests and pastors and explained to them about children with ASD and how to include them in the daily life of the church so that they could come and be a part of the community. And when they did that, the children started to learn to behave appropriately so they could be there. You can do the same thing in any country. We also taught the police how to manage with children so when they got disruptive, they didn't arrest them or beat them up or use tasers. And so you have to go into the community and work with them and, you know, McDonald's and other places as well, which are an important part of social life for children. What are the, if you're going to design a treatment, it seems to me the first thing you do is try to say, what are the things that may actually make a difference in outcome? And you'd want to modify those. So if you look at, um, at children with ASD, having communicative skills appears to be the best prognostic feature. So those children who have communicative speech by the age of five and have language comprehension of spoken language by the age of five seem to have better outcomes. Well, this would suggest that you ought to use communication as a central part of any intervention that you would use. 
Intellectual capacity clearly is a big predictor of outcome. There isn't a lot we can do to change someone's intellectual capacity, with one exception in ASD, and that is measure it appropriately. If we use verbal measures of intellectual capacity, we often grossly underestimate. So we have to use appropriate, generally nonverbal intellectual assessments. Adaptive functioning. Can we teach social skills and other adaptive skills? You betcha. So this is a, should be a target of what we're going after. And then the severity of autism. And in particular, social behaviors, the restricted and repetitive behaviors, and aggression. And can we modify those? Yes, we can. They're both behavioral interventions and pharmacological interventions. Now, I mention this because it means that pharmacological interventions, the last thing I mention, it's at the bottom of the list. And while pharmacology is a lot easier to prescribe and do than many other things, it really isn't a central focus of treatment. It's something that supplements the other treatments in ASD. What are the factors that make a difference in treatment itself? The treatment goals are developmentally appropriate. To teach a five-year-old to drive a car doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So to teach a five-year-old to to manage things that would be typical for an adolescent won't work in ASD, and they won't work for any other child. The treatment setting also has to be developmentally appropriate. You wouldn't take a five-year-old to high school and try to teach them. You have to work with them in an environment that's appropriate. Obviously, you want to pay attention to the child's interest. If they're interested in what they're doing, they'll be far more likely to participate. They have to, the intervention itself has to focus on adapting to structures in time, space, and behavior so that they can port themselves appropriately. Clearly, the amount of time engaged in focused activity makes a big difference. And in some sense, if it's with a responsible, organized, appropriate adult, it doesn't matter in many ways what kind of focused behavior there is, which is why some nonspecific treatments I'll mention later, because it won't be very popular, may actually yield good outcomes. Just spending time with an adult helping you manage your behavior, both socially and otherwise, can have a strong impact, particularly if it's a lot of time. The ability to tolerate exposure to typical peers. Generally, in our communities, group learning is the standard, and so helping kids live with and play with other kids will improve their likelihood of a good outcome. Then learning specific behaviors, especially social behaviors, even if by rote, learning how to greet people, how to say hello, how are you, et cetera, may make a very big difference. And then generalizing skills that may be learned in therapy to the community is important. I want to tell you, when I treat, take care of kids who are very severely impaired, young children, one of the, most of these children do not know how to hug and kiss their parents. Now, I got to tell you, it's one of the first things I treat them behaviorally. Why? Because it's incredibly reinforcing for their parents. Even if they know that the child doesn't really know what they're doing when they're hugging and kissing, it means a great deal. Think about it for yourself. And so think about the kind of behaviors you want to use and how they not only impact the child, but also the environment around them. So what intervention should we be using? How early and how often? It's not clear how early they should be. How often? The more we do, it appears the better we do. And it's not clear that there are limits in terms of the amount of time that's spent, except to the extent that it consumes resources of time and money. Money is big, but parental time is also a factor. Some of these parents have other children, occupations, and other things as well. Clearly, if the top two predictors of outcome are communication skills, then speech and language therapy has to be a central part of an intervention. Since learning to live in a community and acquire a whole variety of skills is important, educational interventions are critical, and because comporting your behavior to that of the environment, behavioral interventions are important. Because families need to sustain this, supporting them and providing them support is important. Then we'll talk a little bit about pharmacotherapy and, and psychotherapy. Speech and language therapy, number one. In the United States, we have this joke that is, uh, what are the, um, three most important things that determine price in real estate. And the joke is 
location, location, and location, one, two, and three. What are the most important things that make it, top three things that make a difference in outcome and treating kids with ASD? Communication, communication, communication. Then we can worry about other things as well. So speech and language therapy. Remember, language is a full spectrum of communicative behaviors. Speech is one element of communication. And even within speech, there are subtleties that are quite important, not just the vocabulary, but articulation, prosody, or the rhythm of speech, and pragmatics, how speech is organized to communicate a message. So in speech and language therapy, we need skilled in speech, speech and language therapists. That often begins with nonverbal children demanding communication. First with gesture. We saw in, um, in the video yesterday with Nofel showing the child how to point. So gesture. Vocalization. Vocalization can be nonspecific at first, but at least making a sound and teaching the child that a sound can yield an effect. And ultimately words, phrases, and then the ultimate goal is reciprocal communication. I say something, you say something. This works in lots of ways, but includes exposure to natural language. In social events, schools, remember I talked about experience. In the community, with adults, for sure, but also with siblings and peers. And I want to make a brief comment about television and videos. Some people have said television and videos cause autism. Some people say it makes it worse. The answer is no, television and videos are neutral. They have pro-social capacity, they can stimulate interest, they can also be awful. They can create all kinds of problems. Most cases, it's the exposure, that is what television or video the child sees, and the amount of time they spend with it, and an understanding of the impact of that particular stimulus on the child. So screens, whether they're computer or otherwise, are not bad, they're not good, they're neutral. It's how they're used that makes a difference, and that depends on how they're integrated into a treatment program and how responsible adults monitor them. So don't make them bad, it's the people who use them that are the problem. There's also an opportunity now for augmentative communication. We start with the most basic, which is picture exchange programs, using cards so that the children may not speak, but they can communicate their needs or interests and then have the environment respond. We also use sign language. We saw some of that in one of the videos we saw the other day. And then there are now quite sophisticated computers that allow all manner of communication. Children can type and it'll speak for them, or they can use picture uh, selections to create sentences, even if they can't speak. We never give up on teaching children how to speak because that's central to participating in the community. But we also recognize that some may not. I have to tell you, I had a patient who was, did, who was quite bright but wouldn't, didn't speak, um, and by the age of five, she had not one spoken word, and people largely gave up on her. We, she, we had her on a computer, and she was typing, and she could type full sentences. The computer would speak it. She was in a regular class. The children would talk to her on the computer, and it worked out fine. And for some reason, I don't know why, at the age of 13, she started talking. Not great but she was able to abandon the computer. So we never give up on speech, even if we have other devices along the way. Now what about educational programming? Clearly a critical factor here. There are many models, but the best model is to try to include children in typical settings to the extent that it's possible. Now what do I mean by to the extent that it's possible? It means that it's a pl an environment where there's appropriate support for the child with ASD so that they can learn, and it's not so disruptive to other children and that they become pariahs in their environment. There are a whole variety of settings in which children can participate, and oftentimes combining them from inclusion classrooms to self-contained classrooms, part-time in each, pulling child out for specific services, um, in, in classroom special services, the variety is, is enormous. And, but to the extent that it's possible, we want children in school as much as possible for the longest amount of time they can be there, starting in preschool. Many people will tell you that, oh, a child is too young and too disabled to be in school all day. Nonsense. Children after the age of three or four go to school routinely all day, and there's no reason why a child with ASD can't do the same. And then there are a whole variety of learning models that get used, and it depends on which one works best for each child, and depends on their cognitive ability as well. So a child who's, 
who's very low functioning, using functional educational models is far better. But for those children who are bright, using uh, higher level academics may be appropriate and they may learn very well. Remember that all of us start by learning by rote. That is, we just memorize stuff. And then eventually we use to learn to modify it. So using rote learning is perfectly reasonable for children with ASD, particularly in early school age. They can learn a lot of things and seem quite precocious, and it makes them fit into the environment. Some of those things are behavioral, some of those are language, et cetera. Certainly most of the initial social skills are learned by rote. You know, hello, how are you? Uh, my name is, oh, what's your name? Thank you, please. Things like that can be learned by rote and can allow a child to participate in the community quite effectively and can even fool some people into thinking that they're doing quite well, even though they actually don't know what they're doing in terms of our understanding social rules. So don't sell short rote learning in this process. What about social skills training? Social skills training is a very sophisticated process. There are numerous curricula that are appropriate for teaching social skills. This is not a random exercise. And it's important that just sitting and being in social groups, while nice, isn't sufficient. Children need structured social um, learning models, and I've listed a few of them here, some of which are more evidence-based than others. And social learning can take, social skills training often takes place in individual settings, but also in groups. In fact, we have all of our children in social groups. Um, uh, and, and then we do it at home and in the community, in school, in a variety of settings. And not just one at a time, we do them concurrently. And I've listed a few of them here that may be of interest to you. What about behavior management? Well, certainly doing a functional behavioral analysis is a central part of developing a behavioral plan. And we do functional behavioral analyses on all of our kids to try to understand the behaviors that are impairing their functioning, that interfere with learning, interfere with adaptation, and interfere with full participation in the broader environment. And then we develop behavior plans that, that work with them. Which behavior model you use, you know, I don't actually care. Uh, general behavioral therapy or ABA, applied behavior analysis and discrete trial training, they both seem to be quite effective. And the, the critical factor is not which system you use, but the, the skill, the quality of training of the person who does it. In the United States, it's become quite a thing where you have board certified behavior analysts who then have behavior technicians. Behavior technicians are often high school graduates who are ill-trained and don't understand the basic principles of behavior therapy, and they go out and try to, to do the behavior therapy, and they don't succeed at it. And that's a real problem because that, you know, it's just like you know, sending in a medical student to do a complicated surgery. It's not likely to work. So it takes a great deal of skill and sophistication to do behavior therapy. It's not so simple. And, uh, and it can be done, by the way, both individually and in groups. So in general, in our setting, we use board-certified behavior analysts to, to develop and run the behavior therapies, and we teach the parents then to work as therapists. We don't use um, behavioral technicians. We find the quality is just not acceptable. Not just from the principle of would it, but I let my child do it, I wouldn't let any child do it at this point. And what about parent training? Parents are a critical part of this process. We have two things we have to do. We have to give them skills because they spend more time with the children than we do. By the way, they know the children better than we do. But when we think about parent training, yes, we, think we should really think about family training and the support systems that a family has. So the nuclear family, the mother, father, and whatever siblings, but we also want to include grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, and even community members because this is a hard job and the more people on the team you have, the better off you are. It gives a chance for us to have babysitters and other caregivers that can give the parents a break but continue to provide the treatment program that we want. We have structured parent training to give them skills in behavioral management, how to set up their home for structures, communication, and above all, safety. But then we also provide parent support, direct support by just supporting them in their struggles to take care of their child, but also connecting them with other parents to form support groups so that they can find comfort in numbers. And psychotherapy, what about psychotherapy? 
Well, unfortunately, there's not a great deal of evidence, and that's largely because people haven't focused a great deal on high-functioning individuals with ASD. And people with intel profound intellectual disability, it's not, doesn't seem to be terribly effective. There are now trials looking at CBT for anxiety, depression, and suicidality in children with ASD. I'm not comfortable with the outcomes yet, so I wouldn't say they've reached a level three of uh, evidence, but at least it's developing, and this is something I would watch. Now what about, what can we accomplish with pharmacotherapy? Can we, we can treat specific behaviors and we can decrease problems that interfere with other treatments. And we try not to do any harm. I mean, I'm not curing autism. Anybody that tells you they got a behavioral treatment that cures autism, turn around, walk the other way, don't even talk to them. Don't argue with them about it, just leave. Because they don't have it. And believe me, if they had it, I'd be up here selling it to you right away. All medications have side effects. This is a special problem in ASD. What's the special problem? Because our kids often have difficulty reporting side effects. Yes. Yeah. Um, and just because a small amount of medication works doesn't mean a lot will work better. And just because one medication works doesn't mean, um, doesn't mean a lot of other medications will work. Treating rest uh, RRBs, restricting repetitive behaviors. There are a number of trials using SSRIs, and I'm just gonna show you a little bit of data so you, can, so you see that there actually are data. There are actually, this is a, a Wybox study showing that you decrease re repetitive behaviors. This is from Hollander and his colleagues who are using fluoxetine. This is another study, this is from the Hollander study, showing that there was a clinical improvement that was statistically significant and no overlap. And this is the side effect profile. We always have to look at that. We'll give you the PDF, but what you'll see is the side effect difference between placebo and fluoxetine was actually, in many cases, the side effects were worse on placebo. Um, what about aggression and irritability? This is one for which there's a clear indication for medications. The traditional neuroleptics have been used, but they have too many side effects. There are now studies, and the FDA in the United States has approved the use of risperidone and aripiprazole to treat irritability associated with ASD. Not ASD, irritability associated with ASD. And there's an NIH study, not a, pharmacology, a pharmaceutical company study, which has shown that risperidone, and the green line here, significantly reduces uh, irritability based on the ABC. And about 75% of kids had a significantly positive response with only 11% on placebo. So the differentiation from placebo is gigantic. But it's important to note it doesn't treat all of ASD symptoms. Hyperactivity improved, stereotypy is improved, irritability improved, but social dysfunction and inappropriate speech did not improve. Atypical neuroleptics do not treat ASD. They treat irritability and some of the activity problems with ASD, but they don't treat ASD. And it's important to note the side effects, particularly the bottom line. In an eight-week study, the mean gait weight gain was 2.7 kilograms. This is gigantic and dangerous. And so this is not for everybody. You have to watch this. There are also well-established studies in intellectually disabled individuals using lithium carbonate go back 25 years. And similar studies looking at propranolol, but in high doses and really require careful management. What about a treating ADHD? Now that we can treat ADHD with, we can co-diagnose -diagno comorbidity, how do we do that? Well, we use the stimulants. And guess what? There are now trials. This is a crossover trial looking at parents and teachers, and the reports show that there's significant improvement in uh, hyperactivity on the ABC. There are also other, uh, other drugs, but in particular Stratera and the alpha agonists, guanfacine and clonidine, that have been shown to be effective. Um, and this is just looking at guanfacine data that shows that they improve. You can't read the side effects, they're enormous, but on the alpha agonist, the amount of sedation is so significant that it's probably not a terrific choice. Mood disturbance and irritability, we have anticonvulsants and SSRIs. This is a, a, a meta-analysis looking at the use of any epileptic drugs compared to placebo, and what you can see is that it's slightly negative. So we heard this patient in Lemonade the other day who was on Depakine, maybe an individual who's doing well, but in general we wouldn't use uh, anticonvulsants to treat mood disturbance. Uh, and we would probably focus more on SSRIs. 
And then there's the use of the treatment of anxiety, which is common. Anxiolytics generally are not recommended because about 8 to 10 percent of individuals who take anxiolytics have idiosyncratic rage reactions, not an ideal thing in ASD. And benzodiazepines cause sedation and other complications. So again, we're back to the SSRIs. But there are very limited data in this area, and I would not call it above level 3. There are a whole variety of new medications that are being proposed. None of them thus far have proven to be successful. MGLUR agonists uh, have been tried and have had multiple variations in outcomes. None of the effect sizes are large. The focus of oxytocin in ASD uh, similarly does not, has not produced uh, a uniform positive studies and the effect sizes remain small even though they're quite large in animals. And the same applies for vasopressin 1A, which is related to oxytocin. There have been some studies looking at cognitive enhancers, particularly in individuals with, development, with intellectual disability, and there's some suggestion that they are uh, helpful. Um, and then there are a whole variety of complementary and alternative integrative treatments that have been suggested. Again, sample sizes and the kinds of studies have not been uh, ones that have arrived at a level of confidence, although they're very interesting and certainly worth watching. And then there are a whole bunch of treatments for which there's no evidence or for which there's negative evidence. Poss the, what I have here is on the left-hand column is possibly uh, useful but generally not dangerous. And then on the right-hand side is don't work and are dangerous. And these include chelation, steroids, secretin, hyperbaric oxygen doesn't work and possibly dangerous. Stem cell therapy doesn't work, possibly dangerous. Ozone therapy doesn't work, possibly dangerous. High-dose vitamins, particularly fat-soluble vitamins, can be toxic and cause damage, as can high-dose minerals. When it comes to chelation, let's see, do I have, oh, this is secretin studies. People were spending millions of dollars getting secretin. It's actually a drug that costs about $75, and they were spending three and $5,000 a treatment. And you can see that the placebo was slightly better, but not statistically significantly better when you did a controlled trial. And chelation, we need to remember, is a very dangerous treatment, and frankly, that we're, we've had children, well, not ours, we would never do it. it it's a designed to take heavy metals out of the body. You need heavy metals in your body. If you take them out, the enzymes don't work, and so uh, it wouldn't be surprising that if they overchelate, some children die, and in fact, they have. So this is a very dangerous treatment and shouldn't be used. I think the critical point here to remember is that there are a whole variety of treatments that are appropriate for ASD. Most of them are non-biological at the, this point. That will probably change as we start to understand the etiology in this disorder. And we're going to continue to search for the etiology, but in the meantime, we need to remember that children with ASD get better over time. So our job is to have treatments that improve the rate and the amount of uh, getting better, not interfere with it, and that by having untoward side effects with the sole goal of helping kids to live as independently and happily as they possibly can. And I think we have enough treatments now that more than make a difference, and, uh, and the evidence base for them is quite strong. Thank you very much.